let's uh, let's give a big big round of applause for all the speakers before they were excellent. And I would also like to use this opportunity to recognize someone very special in the audience, and that is my wonderful assistant, Fern. Fern, can you please stand up? Hey! Now, guys, I know what you're thinking. I've seen her on Tinder before. But that's not the case. She's actually not on Tinder. So I'm going to invite all of you to see her after the conference to ask her out personally. I'm just kidding. Fern actually caused us to be a little tardy this morning, so I said I'd, I'd get her back. Um, before I begin, I just want to say that yesterday when I was finishing up this PowerPoint presentation, I was called old for using PowerPoint. And I just want to see a hand of who out there uses PowerPoint, honestly. There's got to be more. Come on, just put your hands up. Help me out. <laughs> Throw me a bone here. OK, so I guess it's a little bit outdated. So I, I don't know what the new technology is. But this is PowerPoint, and we're going to roll with it. Let's go back. <clears throat> so I want to start this story out with a story. We're going to call this guy named Steve. Now, Steve was 17 years old. He was an affiliate. Before SkySig, I was also an affiliate. And Steve had figured out a way to crack Facebook's editorial guidelines so that he could serve ads on Facebook where they shouldn't be served. And we had done similar on AdWords. Now, Steve managed to figure out exactly how we were doing it and copied every single thing we were doing, not just the ads, not just the keywords, but the landing pages. Every time that we advertised, he advertised. Every time we did a media buy, he did the exact same media buy. So the guy that was financing the ad spend for us called him up and said, hey, dude, this is big enough for both of us. Just like stay in your niche, let us stay in our niche. And this guy, Steve, remind you, he's 17. He goes, F you. I'm making $10 million a month. I don't got time for your petty bullshit. So my buddy, my partner, goes, listen, pal, I was a millionaire when you are in diapers, and I'll be a millionaire when you lose everything, because karma's a bitch. And he hung up the phone. No more than a month later, Steve gets indicted by the FBI for all types of cyber crimes. Over $100 million in a Bank of America checking account frozen, and everything, all of his assets taken away. To, to, to today, he's in debt up to his ears because of all the credit that he was extended. And when SkySig became somewhat um, reputable, or uh, at least established, he actually called us up and asked to form a business relationship around sales and marketing. And my partner, who was the same partner in the affiliate business, had the delight of calling him back and saying, I told you karma's a bitch, and now you know. So that leads into the founding of SkySig, because this all happened at a conference in uh, Las Vegas, an affiliate conference. And while we were at the conference, we were approached by a Chinese supplier who had a very primitive e-cigarette. This was, it goes back to 2007, 2008. And he brought it up to us, and we looked at this thing, and we said, wow, this thing is just a piece of crap. And it really was. But we thought with time, if the technology improved, this could be really, really disruptive. So what we decided to do was keep an eye on the industry. And we had a lot of contacts in the affiliate world, and we had a lot of contacts in payment processing. So we tapped all of them and said, hey, keep an eye on this category for us. If you hear of any movers and shakers, do let us know. And pretty soon, we got a call from a payment processor said, you guys need to really look into this category, because there's a couple brands that are now pushing really big volumes. So we took a look around, and everything we saw online was crap. It was these unbranded products that were using a rebuild continuity program, which for anyone out there that's an affiliate will know it's a way to get someone in and then start billing them each month. So we decided we can take this, we can put a good brand on it, we can offer a real product, and we can create a better technology. And since there's competition already in the US, we decided we're going to go for the UK, even though none of us had ever been to the UK. So that's how SkySig was founded. And I want to skip into um, something that we kind of came upon on accident. So before we even decided to, before while we made the decision to go into the business, we didn't realize that e-cigarettes were, you couldn't market them. 
it was classified as tobacco. So after we already made the commitment to go into the business and ordered product, we found ourselves trying to market an unmarketable product. You can't buy advertising, but all we knew was advertising. So how do you market an unmarketable product? We stepped back and we took a look and said, okay, well, we can do SEO because you can't take SEO away. We have affiliates and we know the affiliate model, so we can leverage affiliates. And I guess we can just hit the actual ground, hit the street. So we started on the affiliate model. We, uh, we've created our own software, originally through JRox and then iDev Affiliate. We started doing SEO the hard way, just reaching out, building links, writing a lot of good content. And then I actually just got on a plane and went to the UK. So what we did is we bought a bunch of product. It was the first product we had bought. We arranged for it to meet me at a hotel in London and where I was gonna buy, uh, not buy, uh, rent like a, a crappy station wagon. And what I decided to do is fly a college friend over. And the goal was basically to go around the UK for three weeks in a car, putting product in people's hands and showing them how to use it. So the first setback came the day I landed in London, me and my friend were on different flights, and I, I'd never been to London before. I get to Piccadilly Square, where we figured it would be an easy enough place to meet. <laughs> and, um, you know, we didn't have cell phones. This was 2000, well, everyone had a cell phone in 2009, I think, but um, we didn't have SIM cards and stuff. So I'm sitting there with some camera gear, filming people in Piccadilly Circus, and I see my buddy, and I turn around, High five, chest bump, yes, you made it, here we go. And I turn around and the camera gear is gone. It got nicked. Literally 10 seconds it was gone. So all we were left with was this crappy like 2005 point and click camera. And we went around the UK with that. And I'll just pre I'm gonna show you a video in a second of what we came back with, but just to preface what we were doing. All we were doing every single day was hustling. Hustle, hustle, hustle. We are living in a car or a hostel. We had a very low, limited budget for this type of stuff. So we are finding smokers all over the UK. People were usually hanging outside of pubs. People, um, you know, everywhere that was basically smoking. And uh, we'd put product in people's hands and ask, can we video you? Can we get a testimonial for a website? And then, of course, we encouraged them to go online, buy, uh, buy refills, and then, of course, tell their friends. So I'm going to show you just a quick video. It's only one minute long of uh, what we did with our, uh, our, our handy $70 point and click. Very good. Feels really nice in the back of your throat. That's nice, man. That's nothing fantastic. There's nothing quite like it. It's a pretty cool thing. I, uh, I recommend it. That tastes really good. Um, they've also had people ever smoking, and also it's good to take smoking doors. I like that. I could be used to these actually. This is the best thing on the market at the moment. This is sky sick. That's just like smoking without smoking, you know. Normal cigarette, man. You can smoke wherever I like, and you can't smoke wherever you like in Britain, so thanks, guy. I don't know if you guys could hear that real clear, but basically, all we did for three weeks is go around, put product in people's hands, ask for testimonials. We had a lot of fun, pretty much got drunk every day to loosen ourselves up, and um. Obviously, that's a very simple video, very simple editing. But the significance of it was that 2009, e-cigarettes were a developing category. There was no brands established, but the category was not established at all. So we had to do a great deal to actually build the brand and build the category. So this was, was just kind of a way to show people what e-cigarettes were, that they weren't some novelty, that there was a real benefit behind these things, that they were really like cigarettes. So after we got done with that, we had about 10 sales a day, and that was just from doing what we were doing in the UK and encouraging people to go buy online. So I realized that we had to build some type of depth to the company because I was just by myself, I was a solo entrepreneur running this thing, and people were not gonna buy this thing 
if they knew it was being run by some 25-year-old kid at a Medellin hostel. It's a consumable product. They're putting it in their bodies. So we needed to build depth. So what I did was we built a big contact us page where we had 10 different queues, marketing, sales, support, um, shipping, orders. So everything had its own queue. And then I hired actors. It's amazing what you can get for $5 on Fiverr. And had them be the de department heads. And then every single email queue had a different signature or a different person running it, even though I was managing it all and, and responding all. It built, built a little bit of depth. The second thing was the customer service excellence. And this also got really awkward. Um, but we have, we, we, all these early customers were your brand ambassadors. They were the ones going out and t telling people about the product. Because remember, we still couldn't advertise. So it was all word of mouth. It was taking care of these early customers, building relationships with them. They're trying to quit smoking, holding their hand, encouraging them. So one of the quick story, one of the first people, um, I, I tried to get in the habit of calling customers when they're having a problem. And some guy wrote in, and he spelled his name J-E-O-F-F, -F, which I guess maybe is a common name in Britain. Um, and I had this thing that I thought that British people only wanted to do business with British people. They, they wouldn't want to do business with, this, with Americans. I don't know where I came up with the concept. Maybe it's true, I don't know. So I would call the, these customers with a fake British accent <laughs> that was a, a, bit, a bit of a mix of like Indian, uh, maybe Australian, uh, like Central America. I have no idea where I got it from. So I call this guy and go, uh, good day, uh, is, um, is G off there? Yeah? This is Sam, this is, or I used a fake name. I was Steve Cherry. I said, this is Steve Cherry with SkySig, yeah? Is, a, is G off there? And he goes, G off? Who's G off? I go, oh, name spelled J-E-O-F-F. -F. He goes, that's Jeff, mate. Oh, no, or the, yeah. So, so that, that's kind of a summary of how my, my customer service calls would go. Most of them would ask me where in, where in uh, the UK I was from, and I would just make up some small village and be like, oh, but I've traveled around because they were picking up on the, the phony accent. So um, it was a good bit of fun. So at this point, what was my focus as a solo entrepreneur? We had a fulfillment center. We had logistics. We had a supplier. We had an e-commerce site. So it was basically a, a, an automatic, systematic sales machine. So what did I focus my time on? The first thing that became a game changer for us to scale above 10 sales, which is not significant sale, but it was enough to really call us a business, was we were able to, to, to reflect on our affiliate days and find a way to serve ads where normal people couldn't serve ads. So that was a very tedious process. I'm not going to get into it, but it kept me busy a definite 10 hours a day just keeping ads rolling. But it got us from 10 sales a day to 40 sales a day. Then it was the affiliate management and the SEO. This is what I call having a good ground game. I'll touch on this again later. But in the end, wherever you look for e-cigarettes in Europe, we were everywhere. And that was mostly just manual work, calling affiliates. There was no affiliates in e-cigarettes at that time in Europe, especially in the UK especially. But there was a lot of health bloggers and stuff. So I would, I would ring these people up and email them and, and convince them that e-cigarettes were a real product and that they could make a lot of money working with us. SEO, obviously anyone who's done real good SEO work, it takes a long time, it doesn't happen overnight. So we weren't getting sales from SEO, but we, again, we knew we were building a good brand and something that would be a, a many year uh, production. So we, we took the right path and we worked hard on it every single day. So that was the sales basically, AdWords, affiliate management and SEO. The other stuff was the email queue management, 100 emails a day, coming in different queues, managing all those. And then, of course, inventory control was absolutely crucial. These people were buying nicotine from us. They were using our product to stop smoking. I don't know if anyone in here has tried to stop smoking, but when you're relying on something, doesn't matter what it is, to quit smoking and you don't get that, you go nuts. So if we didn't get product to people when they were expecting it, they would scream bloody murder. It was not fun to deal with. So this began the nomadic growth. I don't know if you can see it up there, but this is relevant because this was the most enjoyable part of the business. This was about a year of the business. After we got all these processes in place, we were now at about 40 sales a day. I took off, and I had never done anything nomadic before. I'd never traveled. I'd always been cooped up in Florida. And so this was new to me. And I, I mean, this was right around the time I read the four-hour work week and started reading about all this stuff. And I just... It was a really special time in my life. Um, 
here is over in Turks and Caicos, went through all through Central America to Medellin. Anyone go to Medellin? That's Tiger Paw. That was my next question. Yeah. Who's been, has anyone been to Medellin? Let me see hands. It's like all guys. <laughs> anyone been to Tiger Paw? One. Okay. I lived at this hostel for about two months. And um, yeah, I mean, it was an amazing time. That was an awesome time. Um, all through Europe, Morocco, North Africa. And um, this was, for me, this was, this was my dream. This was, it wasn't, um, there was things I wanted to do, accomplish in life, but I started getting really into the Tim Ferriss thing. And, and um, this was, it, you had to remind yourself every single day to enjoy it because we never knew what was going to happen with the business. It was kind of a gray area of business. You never knew if the government was going to shut you down. You never knew if you're going to get sued by somebody. So you just had to really remind yourself every single day to enjoy it. And my nomadic phase came coming to a pretty quick end right about after this photo was taken. And this was in Estonia. And this monster of a man, I'm almost six foot, minus two inches. I don't know how big this guy was, but basically I, I had my friend um, that had came over with me to do the UK roadshow, he was in Estonia with me. And we woke up in the hostel the next morning, completely beaten to smithereens. I had a broken hand, a dislocated shoulder. My buddy was black and blue all the way through his body. And we don't remember to this day what happened. And we had been drinking all through college together, getting wasted all through college together. Never have we both bl blacked out in the same night. And it happened. We don't know what happened. But that was the last photo that was taken. And of all the things, of all the things that we were left with was my digital camera. Everything else was stolen, passports, everything. So I kind of had this moment of clarity where I'm sitting here like completely black and blue in a lot of pain in this, this crappy hostel in Estonia. And I said, what the hell am I doing? We need to take this business seriously. Like we have a substantial business here. I gotta, you know, I have to, I have to really start focusing on this. So at this point, this day, we had passed 200 sales a day, and we went out and got smashed to kind of celebrate. Um, so at that point, I knew it was time to, time to get a little bit more serious about the business. And also, right about that time, we lost a crucial revenue stream, AdWords. AdWords, at this point, was responsible for about 100 sales a day. One morning, we woke up, and we couldn't get it started again. So our sales went from 200 to 100, which felt like the entire business was failing. So I went to the UK. And I hired a guy straight out of college. He was only 22 years old. His name was Damo. He was the man. His only experience at the time was working as a stock boy in a supermarket. But he had the right attitude. I loved him. So I said, let's, let's give this go. And what we came up with was, there's st you still couldn't advertise. What we came up with was, let's try a mall concession or a mall kiosk. For some reason, the malls in Scotland had no problem with us going in there and smoking cigarettes and demonstrating how to use them. So we put one up. And it worked ridiculously well because these products once you gave them to people and let them try it and they actually realized it wasn't novelty it was a real product that could help them they bought on the spot so this quickly scaled from one to three to five to ten and started generating a lot of cash so these this is a typical yeah. okay you're back i think i think we're just going to reset Yes. And then when your whole world blew up, what happened there? <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we break for beers early? <laughs> this might be an opportunity. If you have any questions, fire them at Sam because uh, this is, might be a, a bit of an opportunity. What have you got there? Just in a... What happened to AdWords? Why did you lose it? Well... We were doing something that we called cloaking, which basically means like getting around their editorial guidelines to serve ads where they aren't normally allowed to be served. So when we were, when we were serving AdWords or on AdWords, there was no competition, but you could only run a certain limit basically. It would cut out after a couple, after so, so much a day. They just reached them. Yeah, no problem. More questions? These are fun. Yeah, okay, this one. Oh, Peter, you delegate. 
Um, when you started dealing with the supplier that initially gave you the electronic cigarettes, yep. um, how did you go about really knowing whether or not what you were selling was dangerous for the health of people? Like, how did you know that long term the effects of those things were not going to harm people? Great question. So originally what we did is we found, we, we looked at what was happening in the US and we picked the best brand in the US that looked like it had a lot of money behind it. We tracked down their supplier in China, which took all of about 24 hours. And, um, and we originally started with that. Now keep in mind, like when we did this business, we weren't sure how long it was gonna last. We knew the technology was good, but you know, we didn't know what type of regulations were gonna come to pass, if they're gonna make it medicinal. So once we got some scale in the business and we got our first UK office set up, then we started running our own tests. We actually had a lab in our office, which you'll see a, a quick photo of. Um, and we hired uh, research bodies at different institutions in England. There was one in like London, and we had them actually conduct their own study on it. So, okay, you want to continue? On? Show. Okay. Oh, show. Getting that for show. Who knows that that movie? It's PowerPoint, mate. Huh? PowerPoint. No, no. PowerPoint. It's no. Oh, the movie? Yeah. No. Who said it? All right, you can get a beer or coffee, your choice. Here we go. Tom? All right. Nomadic growth. Getting beat up. Replacing a crucial revenue stream. Okay. So the mall kiosk really, you know, we, we probably wouldn't have even done the mall kiosk had we not lost AdWords. So it's it's a bit of a um, bit of fate there, but that also added to what I call ground game. Everywhere you look, someone's going to see your brand. Those malls were getting four or five hundred thousand people a month through there, and we had these beautiful um, promotional spaces. So this this was our first office in Edinburgh, Scotland. And these were, uh, this was a developer and then a sales guy. And we're literally working off boxes, you know, like setting up a beautiful office. That's not something I do well. And we were out hustling in the streets and stuff. So literally this was, this is what we worked out of for about six months. And we were able to, th the main focus now was the mall kiosk and scaling those, getting a lot of impressions and continuing what I was doing with the, the other focus stuff. And we literally worked out there for six months. We were able to scale up to 400 sales a day. And then we had a little bit of luck. Advertising policies started loosening up all over the world as people realized that e-cigarettes were real and they weren't tobacco. They're a lot healthier of an alternative. So we started getting hit up from everywhere, from different uh, media that wanted us to advertise with them. And we started taking advantage of it. The first thing we did was buy remnant print ads. So remnant print ads is basically Let's say it's $10,000 to run a full page ad in a newspaper. You get a contact that calls you at midnight and says, hey, I got a full page space. You need to commit to it tonight before tomorrow morning. You need to give us a creative. And if you can do that, I can sell it to you for $1,000, a tenth the price. So we just started saying yes to everything. Mass mailers, we started buying mass mailers lists of targeted audience in the UK. The mall kiosks were expanding really well. And what we came to realize at this time was that we were very much in a category that was similar to the razor blade model. Razor blade model, you give someone a razor, you hope they buy a shitload of razor blades over the course of their life. And that was exactly what e-cigarettes were. We realized that once we got a product into people's hands, they were buying our refills, and that was the money maker. So at this point, we were at 500 sales a day. We opened a big office. This was all in Edinburgh. This was the lab that I was talking about. We were actually hired scientists to come in and look at every single return and figure out what are the real problems. Because at this point, we're still, we're still relying on our supplier in China to tell us what the return issues are. And we realized they're just full of crap. So we hired these guys to come in and look at every single return and find the faults. And then we gave them a fault report, and they fixed it. And at the same time, this business started becoming a lot of fun. The nomadic life was over, which I, I desperately missed, but we built an office, we hired 40 people at this point, and we had a nice culture. It was just a lovely place to be every single day. I call it like the war room. Everyone went in there, everyone was fresh out of college. We hired like 22 to 25 year olds, and we were just going to war every day. So we started hiring some pretty girls to hang out the office, make us look a little better. And then we started doing some really cool sponsorships. This is at the Premier League. We had these running at all the Premier League um, 
sports. And these were pretty cool because they actually, they did these really smart, right? So these, they could time to put on when someone scored a goal and they'd put it behind the goal. And the media was always taking photos when there's a goal scored, right? So you pay extra to have your ad show when a goal is about to be scored or someone's on a breakaway and then they just flick them and then all of a sudden it turns on. And then we bought a, a, a touring car and sponsored touring car and some race car stuff that was a lot of fun. And then we bought a private jet. I'm just kidding, that never happened. <laughs> and then we had a, well, Alice already said the S word, so I just wrote it. We had, a, we had a, a, um, an oh shit moment. And so as we were growing very quickly and getting our confidence up, I get an email from our secondary supplier who we never done business with in China. He says, you might want to take a look. Your factory just burned down. And I go, no way. I just had this moment of panic. Like, what happens when your factory burns down and you're doing, you know, 500, 1,000 orders a day? You have so many people depending on you. It would take you three months to get ramped up with another supplier. Your business would fail. So I immediately call our primary supplier. They go, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. Everything's fine. I called BS. So I got on a plane the very next morning, flew to Shenzhen, got in a car, got to the factory, and sure enough, it was burnt down. And right after that, I saw the most amazing thing that my eyes have ever witnessed. An assembly line of 1,000 Chinese workers getting a factory right next door in place. And within 24 hours of this one burning down, they were rolling production at another factory. I could not believe it. It was unbelievable what they can do over there. So supply was not interrupted at all. It was incredible. I mean, still amazed to this day. But it really got me thinking, we have to build redundancies into all of our operations because things can happen like that. Any part of your, any part of your business operations, you got to build redundancy into. But this gave me a chance to spend a little bit of time in China. And what I realized is because we're a well-known brand, we could walk into any single factory and see what they're doing. Everyone wanted our business. So for those who haven't done business in China, it looks a little something like this. Four o'clock in the afternoon, you're at the office, they have a nice welcome sign for you, you're drinking tea, and by 7 p.m., it looks like this. <laughs> I'm serious, serious. This is business in China. This was five nights a week for me. I had to get forced to sing karaoke in boxers with a bunch of Chinese guys. I loved it, loved it. So I call this extracting information the easy way because anything I wanted to know about our competition, brands in the US, their volumes, where they're putting product, where the retail locations are, how much they're shipping, how much they're, getting paid for pro they're paying for product. It was amazing how much information I could get in just a couple beers and whiskey shots and badly sung karaoke songs. But it was also very distressful because I realized if I can do it, anyone else can do it. And we're very vulnerable there. So after that month, we decided we have to have our own manufacturing. If we're, if we're gonna be in this business for the long haul and have the best brand, we have to have our own manufacturing. And it also gave us an opportunity to be the first vertically integrated brand of e-cigarettes which no one had done to that date. So what does owning your own manufacturing give you? It gives you exclusivity. So you're working on all these new designs. You're working on all these new products. They're, they're innovating quite a lot in the category. You get exclusivity on that. Secrecy, no one can walk into my factory and look at what we're working on and see how much volumes we're doing. Control, quality control. You have, a, you have oversight on who's hired, who touches your product, the processes you put in place, and of course trust, which is the number one one that helps you sleep at night when you're back in Scotland in the snowy winter and you don't know what's going on in China. So we formed a jo joint venture and uh, we opened our own manufacturing. This is an actual photo of our manufacturing here. That's an actual photo up there. It was an amazing place. It's still intact um, and running in China. It's called Eason Technologies. So over the next six months, what happened was we entered a competitive sales process. We were approached by a tobacco company pretty shortly after creating our own manufacturing. The category is moving extraordinarily fast. People are taking e-cigarettes uh, seriously all around the world. 
And after we got approached by a tobacco company, we decided we'd get some investment bankers, and they did a great job of getting two other tobacco companies involved in the sales process. So we had three companies that were highly involved in acquiring us. And in the end of 2013, we were finally acquired after a very exhausting and competitive process. And looking back on everything from the business, there's, there's so many stories and lessons that I would love to share with you. But if I can just break it down into five rules for, that can be applied to any business out there, especially in the nomadic community, I'll just leave you guys with this. Number one is to work with only A plus people, and that can be people, partners, suppliers, anyone you deal with. And Albert Einstein once said, I think it was Einstein, let's just leave it at that. He said, uh, if you, it's a funny thing about life, if you only, ref, only accept the very best, you often get it. And I think you need to take an approach to your business like this. Only work with people that are A+. Plus. It doesn't mean they're the best coder or the best salesperson or the fastest at what they do. It just means that they're reliable and generally enjoyable to work with. And accountable is, is a big one as well. Number two, practice pre-mortem. It's like Murphy's Law. You have to always be thinking about what can go wrong with the business. What can go wrong tomorrow? What can go wrong next month? Think about com competition. How can they one-up you? How can they strategically move against you? And plan for this stuff. Take a moment of every day to think about this stuff. Build redundancies in everything you do and plan ahead. Because what you plan for does not surprise you, and what doesn't surprise you will not disrupt your business. One second. I have a couple more. Um, number three is to have a good ground game. I touched on this earlier, and I think one of the reasons that we were successful in the end is because we had such a good ground game. Google calls this zero moment of truth. It's literally when someone looks up the category or your brand, there's so much information supporting the sale of it that people just can't turn away. So this is often SEO, affiliates, reviews, blogger networks and stuff. Pound this stuff because it works in your sleep. It works while you sleep and it continues to grow and grow and grow over the life of your business. You get started today, in three years, you'll be amazed how much coverage you have over your business. And you can also apply this concept, if you're a brand, you can apply this offline by literally having a good ground game. And number four is bend the rules. Don't break the law, but don't be afraid to bend the rules. If we had never gotten AdWords up, we may not have ever kickstarted our business. And if we never got into factories that we didn't belong in, we never would have had the intelligence to build our own manufacturing place and ultimately be acquired. And number five, the most important rule and the simplest rule is to enjoy what you're doing. Because if you're at this conference right now, there's six billion people in the world that would say you're already living the dream. You're either a nomad or on your way to being a nomad. You have remote living. Um, you know, this is, this is the most important thing for you to remember because it's so easy to take for granted. I'm living in Chiang Mai, I'm working at coffee shops, I'm doing whatever I want to do with my schedule. That's the dream. So never forget that. Never forget to enjoy each day. Give yourself a little pat on the back every now and then just to remember that. Go out and have some beers tonight and thank you for listening to me. All right, Sam Marks. Interesting presentation. Wow.